This is a podcast from Partnerships for Wellbeing. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Ways to Wellbeing, coming to you from Partnerships for Wellbeing here in Inverness. I'm Jeff Sosinski and I'm going to cut to the chase and introduce you to a man who has been living rent-free in my head for the past week as I've (laughs) turned the pages on his powerful and utterly compelling memoir. The book is called Choosing Joy, a memoir of spiritual trauma survived. And for me, it's a story of one man's at times angst-ridden journey from childhood through teenage years to adulthood, mostly in the west of Scotland, until through a series of turning points, he ends up here in Inverness, where, of course, all the happy endings happen. Along the way, he seems to ricochet between different churches and teachings in a search, I think, for the kind of faith and contentment that he believes others easily experience. But ultimately, this is a story about the author's own mental health journey and the decision, as the book's title suggests, to choose joy as a way to live his life. The author of this brilliant book is John Dempster, and he joins me here in the studio. Hello, John. Hello, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. Not at all. Welcome to Ways to Wellbeing. John, I really have been evangelising about this book uh, all week, and I know that members of our own P4W Cheery Book Club that we have will be listening in um, to this, because I was going on and on about it at our most uh, recent uh, monthly meeting a few days ago. But deciding to write and publish a memoir is its never an easy decision, especially if you're going to be as honest and open as you have been in this book. So why do it and why now? Well, I've always um, been someone who enjoyed writing. I've always um, had a certain slight itch to record my life in little bits of autobiographical writing. Um, and I suppose I began writing the, the book in earnest, you know, about 15 years ago. Um, the first draft was simply a kind of capture of memories. But um, since then, I, you know, have seen how to divide it up and present it in a way which is lively. And I've also seen how the story can come to land, because until quite recently, I wasn't sure where the landing place was. Mm-hmm. Um, but... I saw that and that these things combined to bring me to the point of publishing. The other thing was that, uh, you know, I was hearing of people who had endured various traumas because not of sexual abuse or physical abuse, but simply because of their personalities and the way church and Christian teachings were presented to them, they were being traumatised. And so I wanted to give a voice to people in that situation and maybe in reading the book a bit of hope and I also wanted to encourage Christian leaders to reflect on their way of communicating Christian message, the way of doing church, to do that with empathy, mm-hmm. aware of how people may be damaged by the way things are put or by the content of some of the teaching. So so that's that's the kind of motivation. That's the reason. So for those who have not read it, let's set the scene a wee bit. Um, you were brought up in a religious household. Can you explain the Brethren to me? Well, the Brethren is um, a group that was founded um, in the 19th century. There's actually all different kinds of Brethren clans, but... Um, you know, we belong to what were called in those days the open brethren as opposed to the more exclusive brethren. Um, but it was it was a very kind of disciplined and evangelical um, lifestyle with sort of clear attitudes and what you should do and how you shouldn't do it, what you shouldn't do and all that kind of stuff. And I, you know, very much interiorised this as a child and I was probably stricter than my parents were. Um, but that that was just the way I kind of re- responded and reacted to it. I mean, brethren, many of them now call themselves evangelical churches, um, but the sort of distinctives of it um, in those days were that you, you gathered round a, a table with the 
bread and wine on it and everybody gathered round and then there was no minister yeah. but all mm -hmm. the guys could lead or pray or contribute the women were um not permitted to to do that mm -hmm. um so that was the kind of worship that i grew up with you mentioned several times uh, in the early part of the book about how that religion is about avoiding things that are too worldly it's about seeing a division between uh Christian people and the world, which is defined um, as anything that is counter to um, Christian belief. Mm -hmm. But I had a very kind of um, strict understanding of this as a kid, and I felt um, that I couldn't really join in with others, other kids, because um, I couldn't even try to like pop music because I was sure that was worldly. And even making friendships was hard because I tended to regard people as somehow other mm -hmm. than what I was supposed to be. So I didn't belong there. I didn't actually belong um, in the church either because while I longed to have a kind of experience of um, conversion, basically, mm -hmm. the call to be born again, that kind of experience, certainly as it was presented to me, as it was modelled to me in people's words, that eluded me. So you had this very unhappy kid who was felt he didn't belong in church, he didn't belong out with church, uh, he was just rather sad. And I mean, another, uh, you know, one of distinctive teachings of uh, that period uh, was the, you're probably aware of the kind of left behind um, line of mm -hmm. Christian teaching and filmmaking and book yes. writing. The idea that Jesus is going to return um, to take his... It's just the rapture. Is this it? is the rapture, yeah. yeah this, this is Jesus coming back to take um, true believers yeah. with him and leaving the rest behind, which I think this theology was only really envisaged in the 19th century, so mm -hmm. it's quite a recent thing. But that left me... Um, absolutely terrified mm. because here I was belonging nowhere uh, with this fear as a teenager that um, those who were closest to me mm -hmm. were going to disappear and I would be left in a sort of decaying world to fend for myself and that was so hugely wounding to a sensitive young kid. Absolutely. I mean, you talk about uh, a moment where you're sit sitting by your front door waiting for your parents to come home, I think, thinking, well, maybe this is the day, maybe this is the day. Absolutely. And then I, I used to kind of phone people up just to hear their voice, to, to suss that, you know, they're believers, they're still here, so it must yes. be okay. But even when my parents came back, that was okay for that moment. Yeah. But there's always tomorrow, there's always the next day. Yeah. And it, it, it was a, a very wearing down kind of experience. Are there little moments that jump out for me, almost funny? Uh, you talked about you were actually probably more strict in your beliefs than your own parents at times. And you, there's a moment where your, your father wants to watch a feature film about the war. Yes. And because it's a feature film and not a documentary, you give him a bit of a telling off. I'm afraid I do. And he listens to me, which is kind of worse. Uh, you know, he should have fought his corner and said, look, don't be stupid, mm -hmm. it's perfect. But but the fact that he didn't, he turned the telly off, made me think that I was actually right. And similarly, at a younger age, the story of the circus, mm -hmm. when I was told I was getting taken to, to the circus as a treat. Yeah. Um, and I was absolutely horrified by that because this was worldly. Yeah. And I remember sliding under the table and hiding beneath it. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, my parents didn't say, don't be stupid, John, or they might have said, come on, John, I'm really sorry if you've got this impression. But um, but, but that that's what it was like, and they kind of confirmed me in my uh, rectitude. Is it too strong to say you were indoctrinated? Um, I, I guess I was indoctrinated, yes. Um, you know, I don't think any other word can... Uh, describe that kind of um, experience. Um, yeah, I, I, I was. And, and I suppose the whole of life has been trying to um, realise something of that and move forward from mm. it. What's interesting is 
lots of kids have a very similar experience at a young age, you know, the influence of their parents or their, their school or their church. Mm. And there are usually moments where they question it and perhaps break away, you know, perhaps going to high school or going to university and meeting a different crowd. And when I was reading your book, I kept waiting for these things to happen to you. Yes. That you would actually, you know, open yourself up to other influences. Yeah. But you don't. And for a long time, you always go back into, looking yeah. for the answers, back into that, that same world again. I guess I can only put that down to my own lack of courage and lack of self-knowledge mm-hmm. and the fact that I... Uh, accepted what I was told and I accepted my own ideas about who I was in relation to that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I um, it was a very sad time and I was very sad. I'm sure there were some moments of joy, but I, I, t- I tend to remember creating this kind of persona um, that was a false self, full of language and verbosity and mm-hmm. poetry that I wrote and stuff. But it was all a front for this empty, unconscious of his true identity little bloke. Yeah. Um, you know, it was all masking that. And it, it's actually very sad that I didn't earlier find the courage to, to do that. It was only really when I, uh, you know, when I moved to Airdrie and went to a different church from my parents and found some kind of love and valuing from folk there. The book is beautifully written, and my reaction to it at different points, at one point I think, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of when I read the diaries of Franz Kafka, you know, wandering around Prague, questioning the minutiae of existence, and and I thought, well, this is like Franz Kafka, except in Lanarkshire, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, do you recognise that kind of um, solitary figure of, who lives inside his head all the time. Oh, certainly, yes. Um, yeah, that was me. I mean, I've spoken about wrestling with, uh, you know, these sort of three particular things, um, namely the, uh, you know, the worldliness thing, the conversion thing, and the, the rapture thing. But I, 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 I was forever agonising in my head. And, um, yeah, that, that, that was me. And that continued on later. I think I'm just a questioner um, by nature. I could say to you, there's a certain, the early part of your life was almost, almost joyless, joyless in the way you describe it. But it's not quite true because there are certain points where you seem to be falling in love, you know, yes. at first sight with, with girls and women. Yes, indeed. And I wonder what that's about. Was that looking for love? where you weren't getting it from somewhere else or companionship or just wanting to be normal? What were, I mean, um, I mean, we all it, have crushes, I suppose. It was sexual attraction. Sexual attraction. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I would say. Um, obviously, there, you know, it's an interesting suggestion that I was um, looking for companionship or support. I suppose there was was that too. The girls thing, I think it was just physical attraction and a desire to to love and to be like others, yes. Yeah, yes. It's it's interesting. And the sad part is when you were seeing someone um, and your parents didn't approve and, again, you kind of kowtowed to... to Yes, that's that's very sad. I mean, um, they they obviously thought we were unsuitable, which, you know, they're entitled to their opinion on that, of course, but... um, And, and yes, they, they, they made my life a bit... Well, they kept telling me that I should break off with this young lady, and and I did, um, you know, much to my regret, and I, 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 I'm sure it wounded her too, and I'm very truly sorry for that. But um, you know, I, if I had had the, the courage to be myself, yeah, yeah. but at that stage, um, I just did not have it in me. I don't know what it would have taken. I mean, it's easy to go back and give myself a lecture. But, you know, I was what I was, and uh, the becoming was a slow process, and I just need to accept that that's the case. Yeah. I mentioned earlier there there's turning points in your story. Yeah. And one of the turning points is when you realise you have mental health issues. Yes. And my sort of, I had had um, 
anxiety and depression and stuff and had had various mm-hmm. bits of medication for it. Nothing particularly successful. But I do remember this was in my th- early 30s. It was um, a sort of period of about 13 years, which were really very hard for me in terms of symptoms of anxiety. And the particular thing that, that produced this thought was that I had a real problem sitting at the table at mealtime. Um, it, it was a kind of anxiety mm-hmm. thing, a kind of claustrophobia almost, because you're trapped there and you can't leave until the meal is over. You can't leave in a kind of responsible adult way anyway. Yeah. Um, and I had this constant fear that I was going to run away or shout or do, uh, you know, it's a typical anxiety reaction. But um, And there was always a bit of relief when the main course was passed because that was the big bit and you could begin to relax. But I thought, gosh, this isn't normal. Yeah. There's something wrong here. And I thought, gosh, yes, I, I, this is a mental health issue. And, of course, in those days, um, that was pretty stigmatised. And the people who had mental health issues disappeared into huge um, Victorian um, places like Hartwood and Shorts was the local one Mm -hmm. uh, in the south. And um, so that, you know, my kind of sharing about that with my parents didn't go well because my mother, you know, she thought she was thinking about how it would affect her. Mm -hmm. And obviously also in a Christian context, it was believed that there was something wrong with your faith if you had mental health issues mm-hmm. because you weren't trusting God enough because uh, it was a vision of God, um, rightly, that is, is holistic, but um, it wrongly assumed that mental health issues were different from other um, conditions and that God should remove your problems uh, for you from you if you had mental health issues. So that was... That was uh, that was difficult. I did see the clinical psychiatrist later, psychologist later. Um, well, I saw one psychiatrist when I was feeling uh, a bit of suicidal ideation, um, but I, I had a sort of full diagnosis with one when I was about, oh, I don't know, 38 or something, mm-hmm. and got a diagnosis of chronic anxiety and neurotic depression, which um, was good because it's good to have a diagnosis but on the other hand in the long looking at in the longer term it can lead you to live in the light of your diagnosis Mm -hmm. you label yourself you label yourself Mm -hmm. that's right and well this is another question really but you um you know we think in terms of ourselves as as having this condition whereas more modern more enlightened approaches look at a person and say, look, what has happened to you to lead this uh, to your body and mind reacting in this way, which is a a more positive approach, perhaps, than labelling a condition. Um, But anyway, yeah, I got that condition. And the good thing about that was that the the GP decided to prescribe... I mean, he'd been prescribing different things, which didn't really work, um, including put me on a trial of beta blockers, which, mm-hmm. of course, would slow down your heart. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that was absolutely... That made me worse, uh, probably psychologically, but uh, it didn't do me any good. But anyway, he, he he prescribed one of these serotonin uptake inhibitors, um, and that actually was, was very helpful. I, I always remember 15 days after beginning the first pill, I felt relaxed, <laughs> and I was able to sign my name on a cheque, gently and quietly, without stress. And it was absolutely wonderful. There's such symbolism in, in that, isn't there? Signing your name. Yes. Your identity. Absolutely. You know, my identity is now calm. I'm, I'm assured of my identity. Here is my name. It's so much... Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, of course, it was that that um, gave me the confidence to um, go and find dear Lorna, uh, who's now my wife. We we met through a, an introduction agency. Mm-hmm. And uh, in those days when you did that before, computers, no swiping, you know. Uh, it was yeah. the old-fashioned way of doing it. <laughs> but that was lovely. And also getting the new job at, up in Highland yeah. when I worked with the library service. It, it's probably worth... You asked about um, sort of 
turning point. Yeah. I think it's probably also worth mentioning in terms of the religious context that when I was 21, I did have an experience that I likened to the conversion that I had sought. Yes. Uh, it was in a church when, um, you know, words in a, a Bible passage being read came alive for me in a particular living way. And I had this sense of encounter with something bigger. So, but but in that context, it didn't transform me instantly. But there was a subtle change in me, mm -hmm. and I see that as the beginning, the first turning point. The second turning point was the medication, medication. Mm -hmm. and the third po turning point is, uh, I would probably say, yes moments, um, when I learned, I read a book. Um, and I said, I realised that, yes, it is mm. all right not to hold to all the evangelical beliefs uh, or every single one. Um, you, It is possible to be a, a genuine Christian despite not believing or having questions about some of these things. Yeah. And the book, and uh, yeah, I realised the, the rightness of that in a series of yes moments. And that, in fact, is what the book celebrates. It's a story of becoming. It, 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 certainly the way uh, I read it in that the it was almost in two, there was two halves to it, which I, I described as, in my head, not that the first half was stark black and white, but some of the colours had been stripped out if I was imagining it. And then gradually, perhaps at your first turning point, uh, or the second with the medication, the colours begin to come back into it and then when you meet your wife and then by the time you're a father you know it's full color you know mm. when i'm reading it it's full color which brings me to the the idea of being a parent and shaking off the kind of parenting that you experienced obviously we parent as as a couple and, yeah. and Lorna had her input as well but I mean my own uh, desire would be not to replicate the uh, my parents approach mm -hmm. but was to um, uh, show understanding to listen to the kids who are now grown women um, and to just welcome the people that have been entrusted to us. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, I mean, what, what people in my parents' generation, uh, they tried to often sort of impose their expectations on um, their children. And, and it, still, it still happens. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people, mothers who want their daughters to be a certain kind of woman or, you know, whatever. Uh, so, so that was never uh, my intention. And in terms of Christianity, I mean, we did go to church. They, I sort of tried to model what a, a, a faith looked like, but I certainly didn't pressurise or put any uh, of my expectations onto uh, the girls, Rebecca and Bethany. So... Um, I, I had did learn, I don't know how, you'd better ask them, you'd have to ask them <laughs> to, to know how well I did. But that, that was certainly the, um, the uh, you know, the uh, way I approached it. I mean, can I say a little bit mm -hmm. about, um, you, you were talking about my parents and wondering yeah. whether I, I blamed them. I mean, in a, I don't think I do blame them now mm -hmm. because my mother had her own issues um, with uh, a sort of anxiety, depression thing. Um, and that may well go back to how she was treated as a, a child by her mother. That seems to be in a pretty loveless kind of home, from what I hear. And my mother's um, mother um, had her own difficulties as a child because she was mm. in a sort of illegitimate uh, situation at a time in the late 19th century when that was very much stigmatised. And there were questions as to the um you know who the the father yeah. actually was so there seems to be this line this chain of wounding yeah and when you have wounded anxious people um attachment theory tells us that kids are likely not to get uh, the level of love and attention that they need in their very early days mm. and this can have uh you know effects later so she she was she had her own uh, problems um, which I realise now and um, accept. Um, my parents were very loving. I, I, I had everything that I needed materially. Uh, my father was very gentle, 
kind of soul. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember uh, when I was having difficulty sleeping as a young teenager, he took us out. We, he and I would go out for a walk just before bedtime in the summer evening. And I just remember that as so peaceful and mm-hmm. so lovely. But on the other hand, I remember having had a difficult time in London coming back up and my parents waiting for me at the barrier at Central Station and my mum looking so grim. Um, and there was no, obviously, no hug or no, it's it's all right, son, you'll be all right. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, simply because of her own, her own issues. Um, and then they just, they were, you know, f- followers of the particular uh, faith um, group that they belonged to. And they just lacked a little bit of empathy, perhaps, to understand people in a different situation. Yeah. They were of their generation and in that they didn't talk um, about much emo- emotions. About intense. emotions, yeah. mm-hmm. which I, I really wanted to, and they, yeah. co- they, they couldn't. So that sort of was a bit wedge-driving. And also, the sex education was pathetic. <laughs> you just didn't get much sex education at all, which was a terrible... Um, terrible problem for um you know young people you yeah. have to find it out yourselves yes, yes. um so not, not always accurate either <laughs> indeed indeed so but no i i don't blame them because they mm-hmm. they were who they were and they did their best and uh, i i forgive them i mean mm-hmm. I, whatever that word means in that context but i do not hold it against them you mentioned earlier that offer of going to the circus when you were young. Mm. And when I move forward in your book to the point where you are a father, you just mentioned in passing that you joined in with your, your children's love of Harry Potter books oh, yes. and, and movies. <laughs> I cannot imagine that your parents or you as a young child would have approved of Harry Potter with all its kind of mysticism and witchcraft and so forth. Uh, but the question I really want to ask you is, do you think the young John would recognise the John that you've become or did he imagine himself as a very different kind of adult or did he imagine he would never become an adult? <laughs> I think um, the sad thing is that I didn't think much about becoming an adult other than perhaps as a child um, vaguely talking about being a doctor like my father or whatever. Um Another sort of constant was the fact that as a kid, I, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote from when I was about eight. Um, I did a lot of writing. So I think the idea of me as a writer uh, would have resonated. But other than that, I, I was, the focus was simply on surviving, um, on, um, you know, getting through the next day, doing the next thing that was expected of me, because I didn't know what I wanted to do myself. Back to this uh, rather pathetic character. Uh, you know, I just go back and give him a hug, you know, yeah. uh, as I do at the very end of the book, um, mm-hmm. uh, as you, you, you used to say. But, um, you know, that, that was... I, I didn't really have a vision for um, the future. I mean, with regard to the Harry Potter thing, there's a story about my mother making a, a wizard hat mm-hmm. and sending me to the Halloween party at Westerton. And her later uh, apologising <laughs> for this, because, but I mean, I see Harry Potter as a, um, a you know, a, as a, an exemplar of good, standing, um, you know, against darkness. Um, so I don't have any problems um, whatsoever with Harry Potter. Um, Talking of books. Um I'm a great lover of libraries and we don't have time to go into it, but a lot of your career uh, is spent in, in the library system. And mm. In fact, I think we have to be grateful to you here in Inverness for devising or at least pioneering some of the online systems that we have. Yes, I didn't well. devise them. They, well, were, they were bought <laughs> in and I, impl- I, I sort of pioneered the implementation. Take the praise, John. Take the yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Take the blame when it goes I did, wrong. I did get an award for it. Too. Well, there you are. Yeah. Um, but I have to say, not all of your... Uh, Time in libraries was was so much fun. <laughs> it was only about the book I kind of reacted again to that. Oh, he's putting me off libraries. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be put off libraries because you were you didn't enjoy every aspect of that career, did you? Well, no. I mean, to, I was a, a, a librarian back in the uh, of a public library back in the seventies, mm-hmm. 
And that actually went well, although my mm. feelings about it uh, didn't go particularly well. Uh -huh. um, I suppose the most difficult time was when I worked in education librarianship and I had a particularly um, thankless job that involved me going round primary schools with a mobile library of educational resources yeah. and teachers were supposed to come out and choose stuff but of course they didn't want to and they were um you know they were when they came out it was on sufferance and <laughs> often i was stuck in the playground with this eccentric diver and a mobile library that didn't have a proper heating system and it was dire <laughs> <laughs> but that was just for a while, and that did sort of coincide with a fairly difficult time for me. Yeah. But then, then we got into doing learning exhibitions with young children, yeah. and um, that was that was really good. Really, I really enjoyed that. And in the, the library system in Inverness here, I was doing initially education librarianship, working with mm -hmm. um, other education providers in uh, Highland, and that that was that was fun and. I particularly enjoyed the IT because, I mean, obviously when I was growing up, yeah. I, computers were enormous things the size of buses. Yeah. <laughs> no nostalgia for index cards and wooden cabinets then? <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> None whatsoever. What's been your reaction to the book so far? I mean, it's just out. It's, it's not, it's only, well, a lot it's not of even a month out. Is no, it? a lot so. of people say very um, positive things about mm -hmm. it. And... Um, that it you know reflects their own experience or that they have enjoyed reading it um i, I haven't had a tremendous amount of mm -hmm. feedback yet but uh, what i've had has been um almost invariably positive which means that some people are uh, <laughs> not giving me the negative stuff but mm. i mean the challenge was to put it out there and to get it read by as yeah. as many uh, people as possible and that's what I, I do have a worry about it because I think this book, for my money, is better than some of the books that recently, you know, coming out of the west of Scotland, um, have won the big prize, big literary prizes. Yes, for me, it touched me more than those books because it was so multi layered, there was so much in it. But my worry is, how do we? get it to that wider readership because it's not come out of the one of the big publishing houses who That's have right. big, big marketing campaigns mm. behind it so um i do hope you you'll know better than i because you're involved in the, the literary scene in, in in the highlands but you'll know better than i how much effort has to go in to letting people know that book exists absolutely <laughs> Never mind yes it. yes but i do hope i do hope people find this book and i do hope they read it and if they get anything like the enjoyment perhaps not enjoyment just the complete word but the the enrichment from it that i have mm. then uh, i think i think you you'll sure never regret having written it that's for no, sure no. and and it deserves uh, any success that it gets in the future um you're you are on the uh, on the road uh, with a wee bit aren't you you're going to waterstones quite soon i'm going to waterstones on saturday the 23rd of july at 11 when I will be signing copies of Choosing Joy. And you, do you think you enjoy the life of the the author and the the signings and? Oh, I think I uh, could. I think I could get used to it. Yeah. But I'm not a sort of chain producer of books. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th this is my um, one foray into book publication. I'm sure all authors say that. <laughs> I, I'm sure. I'm sure they do. Yes. Um, John, it's been terrific talking to you. Um, it's a great book and I do wish you every success with it. And thanks for joining us here on Ways to Wellbeing. Thank you very much for having me, Jeff. It's been a real privilege to sit and talk with you. Ways to Wellbeing is produced in Inverness, Scotland by Partnerships for Wellbeing, a registered charity. To find out more about our services, go to p4w.org.uk.